Hello and welcome to Podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn Radio. You can also add our RSS feed to your podcatcher of choice. You can follow us on Twitter or Google+, with links in the show notes. And please give us feedback. Leave us a review on iTunes, send us a tweet, send us an email, or leave us a message on Google+. You can also leave comments on our show notes at our site at pythonpodcast.com. I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Your contributions help us make the show sustainable. For details on how to support the show, you can visit our site at pythonpodcast.com. I would also like to thank Hired, a job marketplace for developers, for sponsoring this episode of Podcast.init. Use the link hired.com slash podcast.init to double your signing bonus. Linode is also sponsoring us this week. Check them out at linode.com slash podcast.init and get a $10 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for your next project. We are recording today on October 19th, 2015, and your hosts as usual are Tobias Macy and Chris Patty. Today we are interviewing Tom Rothamel about RenPy. Tom, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tom Rothamel. I'm the lead developer of RenPy, which is a visual novel engine that people use to make computer games. Uh, that's my side project. Um, by day, I am a embedded systems engineer, and by night, I work on computer games. Very cool. So, Tom, how did you get introduced to Python? You know, I was trying to remember that, and it was about 2003. Can I remember Python 2.3 was the first Python version I used seriously. Um, I was a grad student back then, and I don't recall how I came across Python the first time, but I remember seeing the enumerate and the zip operations and seeing how they worked with the way of decomposing tuples in a for statement. And I realized like that's actually elegance out of simplicity. Um, i had been used to seeing a bunch of languages that had progressively more and more complicated type systems. And Python here, you know, suddenly tries to be, you know, simple and beautiful and easy to learn. And so, you know, I became a fan of it very quickly since I think programming should be easy enough that people can access it. So that's how I found out about Python. <laughs> and for those in the audience who haven't come across it before, can you explain what RenPy is and what your inspiration for starting it was? Sure. Well, RenPy is a visual novel engine. Um, it's used to make a very specific genre of computer game, uh, visual novels. Visual novels are... They're kind of like interactive game books. We present pictures, we present words, often a very long written story, uh, music, sound effects, animations, videos, and often choices to the player. Um, by using this, they're able to pick which direction the story goes uh, to get a story that often feels more interactive than if you're simply reading in a book. RenPy is multiple things. It is a series of domain-specific languages that allow you to do things like write the script of a game in a matter similar to a movie script. Um, there's other ones for making the user interface, another one for defining animations and transformations, um, and of course you can embed Python in it. RenPy is also the engine, which is written in Python, that lets you go ahead and interpret all of these different languages and presents the game to the players. And I noticed that RenPy supports a number of different styles of gameplay. Can you explain the differences between interactive novels versus kinetic novels versus RPGs? Sure. Um, interactive novels or visual novels is basically a term we use. For, it's a game in which we present you know, the whole thing, the choices to the player, but usually visual novels don't have very much, if any, looping back to where you once were. So if you think of it as, as reading like a choose or an adventure book, something like that, you would never go back to the same place multiple times. Um, so a visual novel, you know, it has the menus, it has choices, you get one of multiple endings, you don't go back. Kinetic novels is a subset of visual novels. The terminology comes from actually a brand name for games of this type that we kind of adopted and genericized, in which there actually aren't any choices, and we simply use the other portions of the medium. The presentation of the visual novel format to present a non-interactive story. Somebody simply clicks through from the start to the end. Oftentimes, you know, because this is a visual medium, you do get more than just simply a reading book, but you don't get the interactivity. There's a faction of people that is actually would question whether a kinetic novel 
is a game at all because there's no choice in it. Um, I'm pretty agnostic on that issue. And lastly, RPGs and other, let's call them life simulation games, are more game-like. You, like, in most games, you often will have, like, a central loop in which you will do something repeatedly, be it, you know, in an RPG walking from town to town or in a life simulation game scheduling your day, um, things like that. So, for example, the, a good example of a simulation game is one called uh, Long Live the Queen, in which you play um, the life of a, a, uh, a queen of a country. And you have basically, apparently this is really, really hard because people are trying to kill you all the time. So the whole point of the game is to stop her from dying. Um, so that's a sort of simulation game that Renpai is, is suited to. Um, one thing Renpai tries not to be is an answer to every single possible gaming question. Although, you know, you can force Renpai into genres that it isn't meant for. I think one of the big advantages of Renpai as a tool is we've chosen to embrace a particular genre or set of genres and make decisions that make those that affect those genres directly as compared to trying to be something more generic that could apply to everything but doesn't give you very much despite that. Um, so if you think of it as almost like like a, a web framework, like something like you know Django, which is meant for specific types of websites and can handle a lot of different types of websites well, but once you get beyond what it was designed for, you begin having to fight the decisions it's made for you. Renpai is like that too. If you want visual novels, kinetic novels, simulation games, certain types of RPGs were a good solution. If you don't want those formats, there's often better tools and we'd almost rather you use those because, you know, we want to make certain types of games easy. So, so it's interesting. That makes perfect sense that, that there would be, you know, a lot of discussion around uh, kinetic novels being games versus not. I mean, on the face of it, I would think if there's no choice, then it's not a game because it, it being a game requires active participation on a more involved level. But I, but I can see where it's a slippery slope. Yeah, I mean, I can go either way because I think that's a perfectly valid point. At the same time, if you have two teams sitting in rooms next to each other and one designs, decides to put choices into the project and one doesn't, but everything else they're doing is the same, is it right to say one team is a team of game developers and the other one isn't? Right. And there's the slippery slope. <laughs> so I noticed that RenPy has clearly been around for a while. I noticed some of your games for OS X have, are power PC binaries, which definitely dates them by a few years. What problems have you encountered maintaining such a long-lived project and keeping it current? Well, there's lots of problems. I mean, starting from just the most basic one, which is that, you know, everything has changed out from underneath me. I mean, even Python, RenPy uses a keyword with, um, which is used to introduce uh, transitions from one screen to the other. Uh, like with dissolve, will dissolve the screen from one screen to the other. Well, we had a function that was available through the Python API, RenPy dead with. That doesn't work anymore. That's now a keyword. <laughs> right. Yeah, we've had to port RenPy and oftentimes uh, other parts of the stack, like Python itself and SDL, to uh, to platforms that didn't exist when RenPy started, like Android. Um, you know, we, we did the part the a port of Python and SDL to Android, or at least you know got the Pi game stack working on Android. Other things are just simply you know it's not enough to simply keep the RenPy around since RenPy is a tool. You know, it is a programming language, and not only has RenPy been around for, I believe it's 11 years now, we've had individual games in development for about half of that time. So um, Kitawa Shoujo took about five years to develop. Uh, Break Chance Memento, which isn't out yet, is is getting pretty close to there. And then there's a few others that are that long development cycle. So you kind of have to balance changes you make in the engine with trying to make sure that the games that are under development don't have to constantly be re rewritten to match the updated engine. Right, that makes perfect sense. I was thinking as you were mentioning with, that must have been kind of a pain when they added that feature to the language. And did it, did uh, Python 3 bring any additional challenges in that way? We haven't actually updated to Python 3 yet. So, I mean, that's something that has been on my schedule 
we actually took a lo- solved a lot of the problems Python three had, like for example Unicode support. RenPy solved it at its own like the scripting language level um, a bit before Python did. But you know, at some point, I have to you know Python two is on its way out. All my new code has been written in in Python three, but I haven't actually had a chance to update to Python three yet. And that's something I hope to address in the next year or so. Um, but it is, you know, certainly a, a very big challenge. Yes, particularly given that the RenPy project is so long lived, I'm sure that there's a lot of design choices that you made that were specific to the Python 2 releases and some of the new updates in Python 3, I'm sure, will simplify some of the internals. And so it's a matter of do you just do a one-to-one port and get it working with the new syntax, or do you actually take advantage of some of the new libraries to refactor and redesign some of the internals? That's always a challenge. Or do you do the one-to-one port and then do the refactoring afterwards? Yeah, that's made actually difficult, too, by the fact that we have many long-lived projects, and I prefer not to make them have to go through the Python 3 transition if they don't want to. Mm-hmm. So the result is I have to maintain the Python 2 version through the scope of the, you know, through the scope of these long-lived projects. So probably what I'm going to do is maintain parallel branches of RenPy Python 2 and RenPy Python 3 uh, for at least two to three years to let these projects get a chance to be released and get out there. So that's interesting that you're planning on doing maintaining two separate releases rather than doing what a number of other people have done and trying to create a unified code base using perhaps the six library to abstract away some of the differences. Yeah, that, that's actually what, what I'm considering doing, but I okay. probably would brand it as two separate releases just for the sake of not confusing people. Understood. And so... On the subject of libraries, what libraries does RenPy leverage and how did you go about selecting them to allow for cross-platform development and deployment? And then also, given the longevity of the project, selecting them for continued maintenance to make sure that they wouldn't disappear out from under you? Yeah, RenPy um, is not very dependent on things at the Python level. Um, we, we're dependent a lot on various um, C libraries like the SDL uh family of libraries like SDL, SDL image, things like that. Um, there are a number of other like little libraries uh, that um, there's one which I forget the name of that does uh, ligaturization for Arabic um, and things like that. Uh, we use FFmpeg or libav depending on the platform for uh, video playback. And for the longest time we use the Pygame project, but they haven't really ported over to SDL2 yet. So recently um, we had to re-implement uh, the Pygame API on top of SDL2 uh, in order to be able to move to the underlying SDL base library, SDL2 base library, which is necessary for iOS and really improved our support for Android. I know that the Kibi library has recently ported their underlying architecture to using the SDL2 libraries, and I know that they're working on eliminating Pygame from their dependencies. And so I'm curious if you've considered trying to take advantage of Kibi, or if that would just be too much of a breaking change in terms of how the overall project was constructed for the people who are actually using it. Yeah, I mean, I think that that would probably be too much of a change. It's also like when you're in the games area, you know, oftentimes, and especially in something like a visual novel where you're presenting text at people and, you know, the interface can often be an important part of how games establish things like, you know, how they look, how they feel, you know, emotionally. Mm -hmm. So trying to leverage more standard GUI kits seems like it could often, um, like like it's something that I'm, I'm not, that interested in doing just because I, I suspect it would require making um, sacrifices in terms of how much it has been customized. Um, it could be customized. Uh, at the same time, you know, we have used some of the code maintained by Kivi, like uh, PyObjects and PyJNIS, which are used on the Apple platforms and on Android and, and I guess other Java platforms, but Android is the only one we run on. Uh, to make calls to Objective-C and Java code, respectively. So I see there's, you know, a decent amount of 
opportunity for sharing on that level. Um, but at the same time, like I think trying to rewrite and probably restructure majorly to use a different GUI toolkit probably isn't the most efficient way to go about developing a project. You know, it, it's just that I think we're in, in a very different area than, than what Kivi is good at. And you mentioned using PyObjects and PyGenius, and I'm curious if you abstract away those libraries from the people using RenPy, or if you actually expose those capabilities. Like many other parts of RenPy, the answer is both. Mm -hmm. So we tend to have high-level wrappers for the sorts of functionality we expect people to be using a lot. So for example, there, there's a PyObjects binding, there's a thing, uh, an in-app purchase library that's used on the mobile platforms. And, and on iOS, we use PyObjects to call into code that's written in Objective-C. But from, you know, our user's perspective, um, you know, they just see, you know, IAP.purchase, whatever. Um, but if they ever were to want to import PyObjects and access code that they've written directly or access something that we simply haven't wrapped yet, they are welcome to do that. I consider the availability of that to be a portion of, of you know, the RunPy API, um, which means in general, that's actually that sort of like ability to both work at a high level, but also to have tools available in case you do need to import underlying libraries or in case you need to extend the way RunPy is implemented and things like that is something that I really like about using Python as an implementation language. Since by having the engine written in the same language as the scripting language that's used by the engine, it really does lend itself to being extended and metaprogrammed and all sorts of other things. Absolutely. Tobias, maybe you can help me out with her last name, but when we interviewed Jessica about the Python community and the talk she gave a number of years ago, I do remember... Pardon me? Jessica McKellar. Yes. Thank you very much, Jessica McKellar. Jessica, I apologize for forgetting your last name. You are awesome. Uh, we She talked about how she felt like, you know, ease of packaging for Python mobile game developers was was like a key aspect to the platform. And it, it just it just strikes me having talked to the Kivi folks and now Tom talking to you about RenPy, you know, people are doing this stuff. And it's like, if... If there's so much pain around this, why don't we take these technologies that are enabling, you know, RenPy and Kivi to make mobile games uh, available fairly easily? Why aren't we making that, you know, those technologies more accessible slash widely available, you know, and make Python a first class mobile game development platform? It's just kind of strange to me because, I mean, Tom, you're talking about how RenPy already runs on Android and iOS and all the desktop platforms. It's just, I couldn't help but remember her the discussion around that with her and feel like this is a missed opportunity on the part of the Python community. Yeah, I, I think that that's actually one, having solved that problems, at least for a specific application, a specific genre of game, is I think one of the reasons why RenPy has been so successful. Um, I'm pretty proud that RenPy has one-click distribution for the desktop applications where you click a button and it creates either a single zip file or three zip files for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, Android is a little more involved because it has to down, go and download some extensions to RenPy, then download, um, then download the Google SDK. You have to have Java installed on your system already, but it will download everything it needs to package for Android. And then it's one click to down to build, to install on your device and run the device. iOS is still a bit of a pain point because you know you need a Mac, you need it set up with Xcode and all of that. Um, there isn't a good way to just go and, and build and run on the device that I've been able to figure out yet. But um, I, I do think that you know really one of the things that has let RenPy become very successful in its area is just that, you know, we've spent a lot of effort solving the packaging problem for Python applications. Um, I do want to at some point, and it's, you know, it's kind of hard to find the time to this with, you know, all the other stuff, you know, all, all the things that people report around RenPy and so on, but to try and take our packaging tools, most of which are at least fundamentally built around packaging arbitrary Pygame or really Pygame STL2 applications and make them, you know, extend them such that you can 
package those arbitrary applications rather than simply being limited to builds of RunPy itself. So potentially taking uh, the RunPy launcher and maybe setting it up in some way that it, you can build things that aren't RunPy games with it. The other end is I also think very important, which is getting people who aren't programmers, for which this is you know their first language, and getting them set up with everything they need to develop. So another thing I've done with RunPy is I've gone ahead and set it up such that it can automatically download you know, relatively small but programmers' editors um, that have syntax highlighting and things like that all set up for you. So um, when you download the RenPy SDK, it'll ask, you know, would you like Editor or would you like JEdit as your editor? And you can pick from one of those, and it'll set, it'll set that up for you. And then when you click a file in the launcher, it'll open it in the editor you chose. So I think, you know, tools like that you know, getting that out of box experience. It's extending like Python's battery included philosophy to, you know, the build environment and the editing environment and everything else you need to make software in a practical manner. Absolutely. So building on what you just said, because I know you already mentioned Pygame SDL too, what underlying Python graphics toolkit does RenPy use for display and how did that choice affect RenPy's design? Um, RenPy really implements its own uh, graphics toolkit. It uses originally Pygame for about 10 years, now Pygame SDL to, uh, to do the basics of like opening windows and, and you know collecting input and, and that sort of stuff. Um, but beyond that, we just use uh, OpenGL if it's available, um, DirectX via the Angle library if it's not available. Uh, at least for the time being, we can, we can fall back to the software renderer if it's not of if you know there's nothing available, although that will start giving warnings and doesn't give you complete feature parity at this point. But we don't really use an existing toolkit, mostly again because as a game engine, we like it when you know customizing the interface is, is an important part of how you present yourself to the users. So you, you kind of have to implement your own toolkit to get the level of customization that people want. That makes perfect sense, and that's kind of interesting. Have you ever thought about, I know you mentioned it with regards to the launcher, have you ever thought about sort of packaging up some of RenPy's graphics capabilities and exposing them as a library, or does it just not make sense? Are they too custom tailored to RenPy's uses to have that make any, you know, be leverageable enough for other projects? Yeah, I think it's the, it's the latter, just, you know, plus, you know, the sheer work of, of extracting them um, out of RenPy. Plus, you know, I mean, there's a lot of graphics libraries and, you know, I think it makes sense to maintain it as part of the RenPy project because it works with our styling system. It works with the screen language and things like that. But but I think, you know, once you start leaving, you know, the RenPy way of doing things, you're probably going to get options that are just as good. There's also a certain extent where, you know, the visual novels and the sort of games I'm talking about don't need the complete set of functionality that a more arbitrary GUI toolkit could easily provide people. So while reading through the quick start in the documentation, I noticed that there's a special DSL that you've created for defining the dialogue and the narratives. And I'm wondering if you can explain how you created the DSL for building those storylines and any inspirations that you may have drawn upon during that creation. Sure. I mean, RenPy has, uh, it's called the script language, and it's the, the basic DSL for writing things like dialogue and writing, you know, show this image, show this transition, play this music, uh, things like that. Coming up with it was, you know, I mean, it, it's just, it's it's inspired by English. It's designed to be quite re readable and, and fairly easy to remember, fairly easy to write. At the same time, like, I wanted a relatively high degree of abstraction because somebody who's writing a long game you know, you know, over a hundred thousand words is, is not unheard of, and some some are even significantly bigger than that. Um, you know, you're going to be typing this a lot, so I want to make it you know easily typable. So we do have a decent amount of abstraction to make that easy. The um, so the original version of RenPy was actually written as a more standard Python library. This was RenPy one, which wasn't released at the time originally. Um, but I eventually released it about five for the fifth anniversary of RenPy. But it was actually simply trying to make a game as just a series of Python function calls. And that's something I had to abandon because there wasn't any really good way of saving in the middle 
of a Python function. So in order to solve that, you know, I need to be able to save and jump to any arbitrary point in the code. I had to go and implement the, you know, the first version of the DSL for RenPy. Uh, probably nowadays you could use something like stackless Python and, and, you know, who knows if you would need it. I think in practice, the DSL provides a nice advantage because it gives you the ability to, it gives you a more readable language for code, for script code than Python. It's also interesting that it's one of the very few unstructured programming languages designed in, in the past, let's say, few decades. And that's just, and it, because of the, the fairly specific domain that RenPy targets. Structured programming languages, you know, one with, you know, a lot of work done to scope variables and, and loops and things like that, make a lot of sense for more traditional programming. And, you know, you couldn't write, you know, most code in it. But in a visual novel, you very rarely would show the same block of dialogue twice in a single playthrough. So all the constructs of structured programming that provide that sort of scoping and information like that just aren't particularly relevant to the visual novel format. That's an example of trying to be good for one kind of game, but you know, while sacrificing suitability for types of games that are outside of our main. I can imagine that having that DSL also greatly simplifies some of the maintenance, particularly for maintaining compatibility for some of those long-running game projects, because the people who are implementing the games aren't tied to any particular features of the underlying programming language, so they can simply operate within the DSL without having to worry about that being modified from point release to point release of Python itself. Yeah, I mean, that isn't a huge issue. The with statement change, you know, if we had been using um, Python as the actual script language, that would have bit us. But yeah, and you know, certainly it's going to simplify the transition of RenPy from Python 2 to Python 3 that you know, non-Python code um, won't have to be modified at all. So having that level of abstraction certainly is quite suitable. And so can you explain a little bit about how you actually implemented the DSL at a code level? I know that Ruby is very popular for creating DSLs just because of the ease of metaprogramming but I also know that Python has its own metaprogramming capabilities, so I'm interested to hear your experience with creating a domain-specific language. Yeah, we don't actually do very much in the way of metaprogramming directly. It's a fairly straightforward, like they would teach in a compiler's course on how to implement you know, the, the, the first few steps of a compiler. Uh, we parse it using a recursive descent parser. That was originally written in a parser generator called TPG, and one section of RenPy syntax, which is the use of dollar sign to introduce a line of Python, is actually completely stolen from at least an early version of TPG. Um, after a while, just for various you know error handling reasons, I wound up rewriting the the parser just in terms of of just pure Python recursive descent parser code. Uh, that builds up in memory an abstract syntax tree such that each statement is impl is implemented using a Python object. And then we simply do a walk over that tree of Python objects uh, to find, you know, what is the next statement we want to execute. Each each object in this tree just has an execute method that gets called, and that's how RenPy does its basic, you know, script language execution. Uh, one really nice thing about using Python, though, is that many of the portions of the RenPy script language are actually Python either just completely straightforwardly Python or Python in disguise. So one example of code would be, you know, the say statement, which is how you say a line of dialogue, a character would, could speak to you. And so while well, you can put a character name as a string, uh, you can also use a Python variable as that character name, which is the way it's usually done. But you can also use a function that returns a character name or any other arbitrary piece of uh, Python code in there. That isn't used by, say, 90% of run by programmers, but we have people who actually do figure out reasons to use the most sophisticated code available. And by embedding Python, that gives power creators the ability to create things that otherwise you know, would, would require direct support from the engine. So it feels to me like RenPy was heavily inspired by the JRPG genre, 
And as such, there are games where sex plays a prominent role. I noticed dimension of hentai in the docks, which is less readily accepted in the West. Have you ever encountered any pushback on this issue? I actually haven't. I mean, we're going ahead. There's actually that that mention is actually in the um, the example game that shows you how how you can make a game um, that. You know, if you look, it actually does give the game itself gives you a little bit of pushback if if you pick that choice. But um, but we actually haven't had any sort of pushback from any sort of outside entity or anything like that. Um, I think you know part of it is that people see visual novels. I mean, Rampai is a tool used to make visual novels, but visual novels are a medium, and mediums can be used to make all kinds of games. And while, you know, a lot of them in Japan are adult, a lot of them aren't. And even, you know, the, the adult games that they had in Japan, you know, many of them would inspire, for example, television series that didn't have any of that content in them. So the stories were long enough and complex enough and, and you know, good enough to, to stand pretty much aside from that. With the Western community, which... which where Renpai is, is, is most popular, um, that really doesn't come up very often. I actually took the liberty of looking today, and it's about 6% of games have adult content in them, um, which, you know, is, isn't a particularly high percentage. But again, you know, Renpai is open source. People can use Renpai for whatever they want, and uh, I think that's a good thing. You know, open source says no discrimination against field of endeavor, and I think that's great because it means whatever people want to make with it, they're allowed to. I think that's a really good thing, too. I mean, I just have to say, and you'll forgive me for soapboxing ever so slightly, I feel like here in the West and here in the United States in particular, we are way, 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 way over puritanical. Like, you know, sex is bad, but, you know, watching people get their guts blown out in graphic detail and having like innards flying across the screen, that is groovy tubes. No problem at all. We, you know, can have that all day long. So I think we're kind of neurotic about it, and and I, I was actually kind of happy to see the mention in the docs, even if it's in sort of a, a, a tongue-in-cheek way. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it is only a small percentage of the games, but it just, I, I had to chuckle. So, I mean, I, I think that's great. I think, as you say, it's a creative medium, and I think being so parochial about it is just needlessly censoring what could potentially be some really interesting or great art. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's also important to realize that, you know, traditionally Western games, are they're actually somewhat of an anomaly. Like, if you go to a bookstore, you know, a Barnes & Nobles or something, there's a large romance novel section in there, and what do you think those books are about? So I actually got a chance to look it up, and, and they sell, I believe it's about 13% of books fall in, into the romance genre. So it's potential that games, you know, are, are in fact the outlier in, in Western media that, you know, due to a whole bunch, you know, games are for kids, you know, Apple app store, game censorship, things like that. You know, you're missing things that other mediums people take for granted, you know, parts of the human experience that are just there in other mediums. So I noticed that some of the games that were created with RenPy are available on the Steam platform, and I'm curious what elements of the RenPy project lend themselves to producing games with enough polish to be published on such a mainstream platform. And also, as a secondary question to that, I'm curious if you have any sort of dual licensing on the project as a means of getting some remuneration for games that are actually turning a profit by using RenPy. Okay, um... First of all, I can take very little credit for the output of the RenPy community. We have some incredibly talented creators, and, you know, at best I can simply bask in, in the reflected glory of those people. I mean, I, I, I make the joke a lot that, you know, if, if they're Michelangelo, I'm the guy who makes Michelangelo's his paintbrushes. Um, you know, I can't really take credit for anything that he did, but at the same time, it's great to know that my tool is being used for all this incredible work. Um, I do think RenPy, because it's a visual interactive fiction medium, and visual novels in general are, they're both interactive fiction, but they're also visual in a way something like a text adventure or, you know, a twine game really isn't. I, I think that that, you know, lends itself that, you know, you can fairly easily go into an app store, you can see a beautiful screenshot, you know, the gameplay is now something people are quite familiar with, and hence, you know, people are able to polish RenPy to make it look very good. And so I think that that leads to a lot of success on uh, Steam and, and, you know, Itch and other stores like that. Um, as for remuneration, 
Uh, right now, I've been doing RenPy just as a side project. Um, I haven't been asking for money, but we've had some really generous people in the community who have done things to support it. Um, we've had we've been the beneficiary of a humble bundle at one point. Um, several of the other uh, of the organizations have decided to donate money to the RenPy project, so that's gotten it through um, through you know ten years and just you know being you know it's just it's been something like I found interesting enough and being able to be part of these projects has been enough for me. I am considering going ahead at some point and probably implementing some higher level tools like a visual directory, directive director tool that lets people insert pictures into their games interactively. I'm leaning towards making that a sort of free for free games, but pay for pay games um, kind of model there. Um, it won't be particularly expensive, but you know it might bring something, some money in. Uh, I'm not really in this to make money. I'm in this, you know, I really did like visual novels as a medium. I saw some incredible stories I found in visual novels. I didn't know how to, you know, do anything else useful other than program. But thankfully, I'm kind of good at that, I guess. So um, so I was able to make RenPy and let the creative people do that. And I want to make sure that, you know, RenPy is used by a lot of people who have been traditionally underrepresented in gaming and programming and similar things. Um, last time we did a survey, RenPy was 60% women. We're also quite popular in, in, you know, Southeast Asia. Our second largest community is in Russia, where, you know, being able to transfer money in the United States is difficult. So I, I think it's very important that RenPy remain available for people in those countries who want to use it. Because otherwise, you know, I, I don't, what I don't want to be is a situation of taking to somebody who can't you know who can't give me money and saying no you can't use RunPy to be creative since I think that's bad for the world. Yeah, and it's definitely a very honorable stance to rely on the gratitude of others as a means of providing support to the project and otherwise just having it be a labor of love. Thanks. And if anybody listening has a large grant, well, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> When you were mentioning the potential for a side project for dynamically inserting images, it raised the question of how assets are packaged together or how you how you manage the assets it, while creating a game and then also how you manage tying together different elements of the storyline for the case where you potentially wanted to break it up into chapters or manage the overall storyline across multiple files. I'm curious how RenPy does that. Sure. I mean, asset management, we pretty much leave up to the creator to decide something that they consider to be suitable. Um, you simply stick them in, in the appropriate directory. You're allowed to use whatever data structure you want. It used to be you had to manually declare images, but in recent releases, RenPy will now actually do that for you. Um, and then when you go to distribute, uh, it will it will archive them together in, into just a simple archive file. It's not actually very good protection. In practice, DRM on games, you know, doesn't seem to work in terms of, like, actually preventing people from getting at the assets, since, you know, all the information needed to run the game has to be there when you click go. So, you know, trying to get on that, you know, it, it prevents people from just casually pulling stuff out, but, you know, there are tools that exist to pull stuff out. When it comes to scripts, really what we've decided, what I settled on was simply you're allowed to just break it up into multiple files, however you deem convenient. And then RenPy will parse all of those files by default into a single big namespace. There is a construct called the label construct, which you can then jump to any label in the code. And we don't care which file that label is in. So you are able to um, just jump between files using the label construct. Uh, that goes back to RenPy being, like I said, one of the few non-structured programming languages that are around nowadays. So if you were just starting out today implementing RenPy, would you still use Python? And if so, why? Probably yes. Um, pretty much the only serious competitor I could think of is JavaScript. And JavaScript actually has a lot of its own problems. You know, I like the fact that Python is batteries included. Python's standard library comes with tons of useful modules that make writing something like RenPy and make, you know, writing games inside RenPy very useful. I mean, thing, even things that like you wouldn't think of, like the zip file module, which we use in distributing games, makes that. And that's kind of stuff that's very difficult to do in, uh, in Python. Um, 
JavaScript, you know, the one appealing thing about that is that it does run in the browser, which a lot of people want, despite it generally being like a fairly terrible place to play games in and almost impossible to sell games for. But, you know, I, I don't think, you know, really JavaScript comes from the opposite, where it's, it's a minimalistic language and, you know, you're talking about third party libraries to do it, you're also talking about, you know, well, if you want an actual interface, you have to lug along a web browser, which, you know, Red Pie Competitor bundles a copy of Chrome in with each download, I believe. And that's the sort of thing that seems excessive. So the nice thing about Python is, you know, C Python, despite the fact that, like, there's no cross-compile patch, they might have just integrated it. I haven't been following too closely on the Python 3 series. But, um, you know, it's, it's actually, like, fairly written in fairly straightforward C code that's pretty small and runs just about everywhere. And that means, you know, with a relatively small download, like I want to say our, the libraries we use to parse video, like like to playback video are actually bigger than Python itself, or if not, it's close and, you know, the Unicode tables are what take up all the space. So, um, you know, Python is actually a pretty good choice for both a powerful language, you know, one that is one that is simple enough you can present it to even relatively unskilled users and they pick it up very quickly and at the same time it's you know portable distributable a lot of other good things so yeah i, th I think if i were to do run pi again i would be doing it in python also if i didn't use python i'd have to change the name <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome I'll definitely agree that having Python as the scripting language that's exposed for people to add custom behavior I can definitely see how that would be much more user friendly than JavaScript because while it does have its own weird edge cases, from my experience, there are more of them in JavaScript. And there's more of an agreement in terms of coding style and best practice in the Python community than there is in JavaScript, which seems to evolve its own styles and practices on an almost daily basis. Well, and depending upon which camp you're in, right? Are you a Node.js programmer or a or a React programmer or a, an Ember or Angular programmer? They're all different. Um, I just want to also say that I think it's awesome that you folks have chosen the, the relatively rich and programming environment that the native platforms give you. I, I, I think it's kind of really unfortunate that everyone feels this, you know, intense drive to cram the entire world and every computing experience that we might might even ever want to possibly have into the confines of a web browser. I mean, I understand that it's a really capable platform, but I feel like, you know, you can do so much with today's compute power on the average desktop or laptop or even mobile device, for God's sakes. I mean, it boggles my mind when I take my iPhone 5 out of my pocket and think, you know, of how much, how insanely much computing power this thing has as compared with my first computer ever, my Atari 400 that I got in like 1980, you know? So I just think it's it's really unfortunate that, that everyone feels like the web browser must consume the entirety of, of our computing experience. And I'm glad RenPy is resisting that trend. Yeah, I also think one problem with the web environment and it has a bunch of benefits, but one problem is simply preservation of games. Like, there's a ton of actually very good games that were written in Flash. I mean, there's a ton of not very good games that were written in Flash, but, you know. <laughs> but, and the thing is, you know, now that, you know, Apple is getting rid of Flash, now that Adobe is saying, hey, there's a Flash vulnerability, we think the best solution is for you to uninstall it, you know, it's much harder to play those games. Um, by contrast, you know, native apps, it's pretty common you can take a 10-year-old native app and just, you know, bring it up, especially on Windows, and it'll just run. And even if you can't, you know, virtualization of desktop platforms is quite mature. So I think, you know, interestingly, like, once a game survives that first, you know, 10 to 15 year window, I think we're good enough at, at either both virtualization and simply backwards compatibility on the desktop that you're not going to have, I mean, certainly that, that games preservation um, is something that, you basically that the games will be preserved after a certain amount of time. It is important to you know upload them to things like the Internet Archive and things like that to ensure that it survives those first ten to fifteen years. Um, and I think you know with visual novels and games in general being a form of culture and a form of culture that's growing 
more and more significant as time goes on, spending effort to think about preservation now is very important to me. Oh, I, I totally agree. I'm I'm an avid retro gamer and, and some of the younger folks that I work with kind of look at me like I'm kind of insane because I'm playing these, you know, Atari 8-bit games on my ridiculous high-resolution monitor on my, you know, four-core <laughs> Mac laptop. But But I think that there's something, there is a there's a real cultural experience there that is to be had for anybody to go back and sort of play the games that, you know, came, that came out 20 years ago. Obviously for those of us who, who are old and old and crusty enough to have been there, it adds an extra dimension of, of nostalgia. But I think for anyone, there's, there's great experiences to be had there. And I think like, as you say, it, it would be a real shame to have them lost just in the, in the continuing, you know, race for obsolete or to, I guess, to avoid obsolescence or whatever that technology seems to be stuck in. So that's great. And I think actually the RenPy project is, is one sort of great bulwark against that because you folks, as you say, we've already got, you know, RenPy projects that have, you know, withstood the transition from power PC to Intel on the Mac side. And I think that's, that's gotta be what seven or eight years. I mean, What's your oldest project? Do you happen to know? You mean supported project? Yeah. There's um, the Moonlight Walks, which was the game I made. Um, that was like the first real game to come out. Uh, I've been continually updating it since uh, since it came out in two thousand five. I don't know what the oldest project that you know is still supported is. Just going back to Power P for see for a second though, I actually have a pretty good story I couldn't resist. Um, I actually got in a message uh, earlier this year um, asking uh, me to make a new release of the PowerPC version of RenPy because uh, it was a person who had been stuck in, like, RenPy 612, I think, was the last version supported PowerPC to, um, because, you know, she, she, it was just somebody who just couldn't afford getting a new computer that soon. It was a hand-me-down computer from somebody in, in, in the family. So I did the simplest thing possible, which was dig through my closet and just center one of my old computers. <laughs> that is totally awesome. It seemed easier than, than trying to figure out how to compile for PowerPC. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That is a great example of practicing random acts of kindness because now, you know, it's not even just RenPy, I'm sure. If you're stuck on a platform like that that is no longer widely supported, she was probably running you know, 10 years ago's version of Firefox or Chrome or whatever the case may be. And or even if I don't even know if Chrome produced PowerPC binaries. And so now she has a whole new world open to her. So that's that's very cool. Yeah. Plus, I get some extra free space in my closet. <laughs> it also brings up an interesting point, too, about you were mentioning that you have a number of users from Russia and Southeast Asia and being in areas where availability of computers and modern technology isn't as easy or affordable. Uh, having a library like RenPy, for instance, that has been maintained for so long and does still support o older infrastructure, you know, although not PowerPC anymore, but ha having that capability definitely opens up a number of other possibilities to people who don't have as easy access to those technologies. Yeah, I, I certainly think it's it's important to keep the the requirements of RunPy as low as possible, just so that people who you know don't have you know access to upgrade their computer every couple of years uh, can still you know make games and you know make games that people around the world can play. And so, before we move to the picks, are there any questions that we didn't ask that you think that we should have, or any topics that you want to bring up? Uh, no, I think we're pretty good. And are there any particular areas in RenPy that you would like support on? Well, I'd certainly like to work with the larger Python community to get some of our packaging technologies and, you know, potentially try and figure out how to get things like how we build for Android, how we build for um, iOS, and, and get that to the point where at least other Pi game games, if not, you know, other Python programs in general, you know, I think it's really important that the RunPy launcher, which has this one-click build environment, uh, is able to eventually at some point package other games in, in a similar easy manner because there are all these genres out there. Why shouldn't we be using Python to make games? 
Absolutely. You might consider talking to the to the Kivi folks because I think they actually are maintaining some of the projects you guys are using, right? Like at least on the Android side, if not on the iOS side as well. You might uh, you might be able to recruit some some uh, potential allies there, or at least get pointers to where you might find them. Yeah, I know that they have a library called Buildozer, which is their tool chain for for compiling their applications to run on the various platforms. That's correct. It's actually based on the very, very... Now, they've done a ton of work beyond this, but I believe that at least originally it was based on some of the, the very old run by Android packaging stuff. It's interesting how all these things tie together. All right, so with that, we will move on to the picks. And for my first pick today, I'm going to choose DJ Logic. He's a DJ who produces sort of a mix between techno and instrumental hip hop. And it's just good music to listen to while I'm coding. I find it really useful for sort of listening to as a way to tune out the outside world and focus on the work that I'm doing. Uh, my next pick is a set of command line tools that I came across recently called Git Tools, which is just a number of different shell aliases that simplify working with Git commit trees. Um, just found it really easy and useful to use. And my last pick today is a Python library called Radon, which is a way of generating a number of different statistics of your code base, including things like lines of code, complexity, uh, it will show you a number of different other statistics like some of the uh, pilot statistics and it's just a nice way of generating a lot of interesting information about your code base and they actually have a corresponding library, if I remember correctly it's called Xenon, which is intended to be run, it, run on your CI server to generate those same statistics. And with that I will pass it to you Chris. That sounds really neat. I think we have some some uh, some people at my place of business that'll be really excited about that. Thank you. Um, my first pick is a uh, Netflix original TV series that my wife and I just started watching but are really enjoying called Narcos. Um, and this is a really interesting story of Pablo Escobar's rise to power um, becoming the you know cocaine king of Colombia, and what's what's doubly interesting about it, aside from the obvious, is how you know at least is the way they're depicting it, how he sort of utilized the corridors of power and how American interests reacted and why they reacted. It's just it's it's a really good story. I'm really enjoying it, and uh, it's it's good 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 TV entertainment. Um, so I, my link is to the Rotten Tomatoes review of it, and I think it's it's kind of interesting and in telling that the critics give it seventy five percent, but users give it ninety one percent. Apparently, it's uh, it's it's not not highbrow enough for the critics, but we like it. Um, my next pick is the Rust programming language. I have been playing with this uh, over the last week or so, and it has been kind of a revelation for me in that um, I you know I've used C and C plus plus actually a fair bit through the years, but it never seemed to really stick. I've even done it professionally for a while, but it's never been a real tool of choice. And Rust, which builds code that executes at or or very close to C and C++ speeds, um, is just, it's a joy to use. It, it, it is as pleasant to use as any number of higher level of abstraction languages uh, it, it takes a really new tack to problems like concurrency and memory allocation. Um, and so far, it's just, it's a real joy to use. They've really thought this one through in terms of, of uh, building it and designing it. And I think people should go check it out. Even if you're like me and you're sort of like, I don't do, you know, low level code like this. Uh, and it's also been integrated very heavily into, you know, you can, you can um, write code you need to perform you know better in um, more quickly you can embed it in python programs ruby programs .net programs it's really it's it's impressive stuff and it is somewhat early days still but i think um, people should at least you know give the tires a kick i think you might be pleasantly surprised my last pick is a beer um, because i went to a beer tasting festival a couple of weekends ago with my lovely wife and a good friend 
And um, this one made the biggest impression on me. It's from uh, a really small brewery called Kent Falls Brewing, and it's called the Sh- uh, Shower Beer. <laughs> and uh, what's really kind of unusual about it is it's a goes made with lemon zest. And you taste this beer, and it is a massive hit of lemon to your face. Like it, it's it's seriously pucker worthy, and it's act, but it's actually. Um, kind of also related to a wheat beer so you then get that sort of you know wheat beer flavor on sort of the on the 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 back side it's really tasty really refreshing stuff i would definitely enjoy some of this you know on a hot summer day after having done physical labor and uh that's it for me for picks tom what do you have for us uh three things first off uh, i just want to thank the scython programming language which is a language that's used to make Python extensions. Um, it lets you write Python style code, but that code can both be called from Python and call Python, but it can also call into C. And also you can add C style type annotations to the language, which lets that code run as fast as C. Um, what's very useful is they actually have a feature, the dash A option, which produces an HTML document for each line of your program that lets you see what code it's producing and it'll actually color the lines in letting you know you know this is adding two python integers together so it's a sequence of function calls versus this line is adding two c integers together which means that it is very fast um my second pick is the npr one app which is a sort of like pandora for like news and other factual content basically uh put it on your phone or you can even listen to it on the computer and it picks, you know, stories out at random, both news and like other sort of like economics and other interesting stories. And my third pick is the Seinfeld method, which is a sort of life hacky type thing, which is simply a way of motivating yourself to get things done. You simply decide what you want to do. You get a nice big yearly calendar, other big calendar. And then every day you do something, you get out a big magic marker and you put an X through that day. And after a while, you start getting some streaks together and, you know, the motivation that, well, do I really want to break a two week streak of doing something is enough to um, to get you to like get started on something in a day when you might have said, ah, whatever. Um, GitHub actually has a streaks feature that is also very useful for this sort of thing. All right. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today and tell us all about RenPy. So for anybody who wants to follow you and keep up to date with what you're doing and the work on RenPy, what would be the best way for them to do that? Probably the best way is just going to our website, which is RenPy.org, R-E-N-P-Y.org. There's links there to various social media. Um, Following me directly on Twitter will let you find out about the latest in RenPy, but also let you find out about all sorts of other things I find interesting, which you may not. But certainly the RenPy website has all the downloads and the announcements and so on. Do you mind giving us your Twitter username for our listeners? Sure. It is uh, RenPy, Tom. R-E-N-P-Y-T-O-M. All right. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time, and I'm sure all of our listeners will be very interested to learn more about RenPy and its history. So thank you again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye.